Okay, um, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the music. You might be wondering why all this is, is happening. This is a very exciting uh, luncheon for us, not only because Megan is here, but also for the first time uh, we are actually having a live feed to Cambridge. And there's having a minor, a little luncheon there. So we've got like a satellite set up. This is a beta setup. So hello to everybody in Cambridge. I hope you're hearing me well. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing this for, for all of our, our, our luncheons. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Eric Teacher, who is the membership, sorry, the sponsorship uh, chair, to say a few words. Welcome everybody and Happy New Year. I uh, just wanted to welcome and to thank our uh, slate of sponsors for this year and to welcome two new sponsors, Beta Telco and GBA Lighting. Uh, we, we appreciate all of the, uh, the sponsorship funds and all of the uh, things that, uh, that your funds help the IS Toronto section uh, bring to you, our members. Thank you and enjoy your lunch. As always, uh, for those of you who are not members of the IES but have always wanted to be a member or were thinking about it or just IES curious, we have Mr. Prem Kumar is the chair of, uh, of membership. He's also the, uh, the vice uh, president and you can speak with him. He'll be able to fill you in on all the wonderful benefits of being an IES member. Now I'm going to turn it over to the education chair. That's me. <laughs> to, uh, to let you know of the education that is coming in the very near future, we have our fundamentals, which will be he held from February 5th to February 7th. It is the first time we're doing this fundamentals. It is a new 10-module uh, system. Looks really interesting. I hope I can, uh, can read it up on it before I actually have to present it. We also have our intermediate program. This is run only once every two years. It will be starting on March 2nd, run every Wednesday evening until the end of May. So those are our two educational uh, opportunities coming forward. Now without further ado, I want to uh, introduce the uh, technical luncheon chair, John Boker, who's done a wonderful job, an absolutely wonderful I'm very active in the IES myself. I serve as the Illumination Awards Chair. So thank you, Joanne Emmer, right? You're the Chair for the Illumination Awards Toronto. This is not an easy job, thank you. It's, but it's a fun job, right? 
Um, I also want to say I've had the pleasure of meeting our new executive vice president, uh, Tim Lysitra. I'm so psyched about his vision, his future plans. His, he's, a, he's a good listener. Um, he wants only the best for the society, which includes growing it and serving membership. And I'm, I'm really pleased about that. Uh, it only makes me more engaged about the things I do for the, for the society. All right, so to the presentation today, LEDs and getting color right. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about how we can achieve that. Um, I've got a PowerPoint presentation. I've got some demonstration equipment here. Um, show of hands, who specifies lighting in this room? S lighting specifiers. Engineers? Architects and interiors? And then there's sales reps and manufacturing people in the room? OK, great. Um, thanks for coming. I'm very impressed. Because um, of course I'm comparing notes. New York does it this way, Toronto does it this way. This is very good. Um, so the agenda today, where's my clicker? That's what I need. Where do I click? Okay. Okay. So what we're going to look at today is color science. It's the terms and the words and the maps and the graphics we use to describe color and color rendering. It's the application of color science. How do you get color right with LEDs? Is that possible? And then what's your checklist for specifying LED luminaires? And as we look at um, color science and how we describe color, have you ever tried to describe color to someone who is not in this room? Um, there's the consistency of those color points, and then, of course, color rendering. That generic one-size-fits-all metric, which no longer fits our industry today, which is why I'm going to try to get to TM30 at the end, which I think is a fabulous, very helpful and objective tool introduced by the IES last fall, TM30. So these are the building blocks of color perception. This explains how my brown eyes and your brown eyes might see the same color very differently. You're a different culture than I am, so we have a different cultural upbringing. We have uh, adaptation.
by incident light in various ways. So for example, reflection, you might be looking um, at an image reflected in a mirror. In, there's transmission, there's absorption, like a matte finish in the reflector is going to change color. Um, there's scattering and, and sparkle, and then there's fluorescence or, or a stippled uh, troffer overhead with that kind of um, louver is also going to separate color potentially depending on, on what's in it. And applications for a direct emission might be a museum, might be retail when you don't want any filter between the viewer and the object. Um, and these are ways we can quantify light scientifically. It's a, it's, a hap, it's a good measurement. And these are also, again, filters and variables that affect how we see light, how we see color. We have three cones. Dogs don't. Dogs don't see our color world. Um, blue cones are short wavelength, or the, they, they, they perceive the short wave. The three cones see color, blue, red, green. Blue is the short wavelength, red is the longer wavelength, and green sees it and mixes everything in between. So those are our three color cones. Um, all those other colors in between are seen by our cones working together. Unfortunately, or however, I should say however, if you are a man, seven to eight percent of you have a color deficiency. And it's primarily in men, not women. Um, so that can be a challenge as well, depending on where you fall into your age group, your cultural conditioning. Um, consider those factors. And then there, and what I'm speaking to is uh, metamorism, observer metamorism. Although these guys are both looking at the same source, same thing, they have a metamorism that prevents them from seeing the same color in the same way. So cultural adaptation, biological, brain adaptation, macular pigmentation of the eyes. Pale blue eyes versus the way brown eyes, all those things influence how we read, perceive, and absorb color. So there are the cognitive factors and the biological factors that influence how we see color and why my LED luminaire and your LED luminaire, although they might be exactly the same, we don't perceive them the same way. Um, it's processing by the brain as well as some of the uh, hardware that gets in, the, in between. And then there's color discrimination. This is a really challenging test. Uh, it's something in the industry that is used to measure color acuity. So if you're a graphic designer, if you're doing print work, if you work for Pantone, you need to have precision vision when it comes to color. And so in this test, you match those 84 caps in range of saturation of hues. And this is actually the uh, result of my colleague taking this test. And he had a deficiency in the green range. He couldn't get all the greens spot on. But everything else, he did a very good match. And so, and you test, you use a 6,500 degree Kelvin reference source, and that's for color matching. Um, and you have to put them, those caps, they're all tumbled out. And then like um, a roulette wheel, you have to put the caps back in place in order of graduated hue. It's really challenging. Um, this is also a perfect example of how your brain overpowers what you see. So clearly, there are two shades or four shades of grays and color up here, right? So now take two pieces of paper or take your hands and do this and block out the background. Block out that gradation. Does anyone see a difference? Does anyone see a difference? That was a yes. You can see that when you look at it this way, that gray panel on the interior looks like to be a, a gradation darker, lighter. But if you block out the background, that gray rectangle is all the same color. That's your brain on color. You've heard of your brain on drugs? This is your brain on color.
So that also interprets how we see color, how we see light. And this is also talking to adaptation where you assign color to an object like that banana or that red apple. You know what color it is. OK. Then next, let's look at SPDs. I think more than anything else, the SPD is the thumbprint, is the unique DNA of each source. Because you can see represented in this beautiful filament G lamp, the red oranges, some, some green yellows, and a tiny little bit of blue. So no wonder why uh, we aspire to achieve that with LEDs. Looking at a compact fluorescent, obviously, you know that this is why CFLs, linears, might make you feel less than crisp alert awake, or, or too much crisp alert awake, because there's not warm, there's not rosy red. So if it isn't here in the SPD, it's not going to be in the output. It's not going to be in the object you're lighting. It's not going to create that warm, rosy experience. Think about having a cup of coffee at Starbucks versus a cup of coffee at McDonald's. Where do you want to linger longer over that latte? You want to be in a comfortable environment, and that's suggested by lighting. And on a gray day like this, yeah, I want to be in that Starbucks having coffee. Um, and then you look at um, LEDs. So all of us start here pretty much. Whether you're Cree or Osram or Zocado or Philips, we start here and then we do something to it. We make magic happen. Um, but you can see now why there is such a, a cold blue white light in an LED that's not treated or that's not color corrected. But look to the SPD, and that is a fingerprint, uh, uh, the DNA of the source. This is the uh, spectral power distribution. SPD at work. So on the left, we have an LED that has been somewhat color treated. Um, there's still a very prominent blue peak wavelength, but we've got a little bit of more warmth in it where, where that same car in a parking lot in San Jose under a low pressure sodium source looks entirely different. Same car, same parking lot, we just moved it around the corner to show the difference between a full color spectrum or something closer to an 80 something CRI versus LPS. And then there's color appearance. On its own, those sources might look like this. This looks warm, inviting, golden, and rosy. Um, but then I throw up the other SPDs, and I have the output of the LED, the compact fluorescent, and the incandescent. So before you saw the bar graph or the SPD curve, and now I'm showing you what that lit effect is. So it's. It's tricky. There's lots of components to consider, as you know. So let's look at the 1931 chromaticity diagram. Um, so this map is simply a, a 2D or two-dimensional representation of color space. Um, and this is one of the new components, very important in TM30, because it measures um, both on the color space and then with other values what the uh, end game is. So this was the first color space. Um, the black body locus here examines where uh, color might reside. So there's a 3,000 Kelvin, there's a 3,000 vector line riding right up here. It slices through that color space. And anywhere on that linear vector line is 3,000 Kelvin. But you can see. The top of the 3K looks a little bit more golden. The bottom of the 3,000 is just beginning to hit that pinkish hue. But technically, any color, any source that hits on that line is considered 3,000 Kelvin. Aha, this is the first time, a first point, or another point, I should say, where you can miss. Because you could have one luminaire that's at the top of the 3,000, and the one next to it is at the bottom of the 3,000, color differences. But technically, our society, our industry, NEMA, ANSI, that source, it's 3,000, because it sits anywhere on that black body, on that line. 
And uh, to talk further about the chromaticity diagram, um, the black body glows, reflecting the radiation that falls on it. Um, the SPD, or the color, depends on its temperature. The black body locus is that line going through. And then CCT, um, it's the temperature of the, uh, that black body. That has to, it has to reach that temperature to produce the same source um, color as the given source. This diagram is also uh, upgraded. It was, if this is the next diagram, and it was more uniform than the last one. There were subtle changes in it. So this is a second black, uh, this is a second color map. Okay, so we had the linear thing. Now we have DUV. So get that last color map in your head. Here's the black body. I said some, one source could be 3,000 Kelvin up and the other one could be 3,000 Kelvin down. This is another way to measure that. And so you can see if you're five steps below or five steps above, color is going to be shifting a little. So this is another metric to look for, a positive or negative DUV, because that will help you visualize where in the color space that end color is going to result. And I think to help right now, I'm going to uh, ask this gentleman right here in the blue shirt to come up. This is the live demonstration part of our show. By the way, in New York, we call these flashlights. I, I don't know what you call them. I, I live in New York. So you can see um, on the ceiling, everybody, right? These are both 3,000 Kelvin, right? They're both 83 CRI. And they both don't look alike, do they? And your name? Greg. Greg. Yep. All right, so here is Greg wearing a nice blue shirt. Turn to the audience, Greg. Nice blue shirt. Oh, whoa. Did, that, did anyone else see that? No, I didn't. <laughs> 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 Check, someone said it. <laughs> All right, so this source is off the black body locus. Yet, yeah, it's an 83 CRI, it's 3000 Kelvin, and they're both 2000 lumens. So you can see, even looking at the ceiling, I'm telling you they're the same. Except one source was designed to fall below that black body. And the result is Greg in a, in a nice blue shirt or Greg in a rich uh, uh, shirt. You know, brand new shirt, used shirt. Brand new, <laughs> used. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> so point being, above, above, above and below the black body, The question from the audience, which I'm repeating for Waterloo, yes. uh, is what is uh, an acceptable plus or minus above the black body locus? That is subjective. Uh, it depends on what are you doing, what are you lighting, what's your budget. Um, we suggest no more than three, because that's where your visual system will start to see a difference, which is why when you've got two track fixtures, and if it's beyond three, you're going to see that color difference. Can I ask? Oh. Yes. Question? Sorry, he's being more polite. He put his hand up. I just... <laughs> Go ahead. Um, where does one find this information?
And green, up there in the top left, in that point, it took, it had wider tolerances. People couldn't detect green so much, shades of green. But their visual acuity, their color acuity, was more precise in the red-orange range. And I think a nice analogy to think of if you need a visual is sunset. Can you possibly describe the range of colors that the sun goes through as it sets? The warm, rosy, saturated, or pale hues. Whereas a blue sky, it's blue. It doesn't have a lot of variation. Green, somewhat the same. So people were more sensitive in the red-orange range than they were in the green. And cheap LEDs, low quality, where color doesn't matter. If you're doing the Goodyear rubber store that sells black tires, you know, color isn't that critical. So a lower quality LED that might even have a four or five step macadam ellipse metric, it's gonna be fine. What are you lighting, what's the application? Um, An SDCM, standard deviation color matching. And these are steps away from that target black body, which is a highly desirable color point to manufacture to and to specify to. And this is using the 1976 color space. And it was mapping color sensitivity before there was that cap game with the 84 color points. This is somewhat lacking in that when this test was applied in 1940, it was 200 participants. It was uh, mostly white Caucasian males working at Kodak. Uh, and it was a limited range of colors under, uh, I believe, one or two different sources. So today, this is still valid. It still explains the visual system. But there are other metrics to include, such as gamut area, fidelity, CRI, Kelvin, TM30. And then, of course, there's color rendering. It's the ability of a source to render color in objects or people. Um, we believe that uh, and, and to prov the, the purpose of color rendering in the source provide visual information of an object to the viewer. It needs to display colors naturally. It needs to make colors easily distinguishable. And it also displays um, vividity, selected vividity. And when I was showing uh, Greg in his blue shirt, that's an example of displaying selected vividi vividity. That second source, the one that made his shirt look new, is off the black body. It has a higher blue peak wavelength as a result, so his shirt looked brighter. That's specifically or selected vividity. Color rendering zero, uh, zero to 100. Best color rendering is 100. At least go with a minimum of 85. Um, whoops, did I miss one? OK. <clears throat> and CRI, yes? What's the definition of colors naturally? Uh, the question is, what is the definition of colors naturally? Good question, subjective answer. Uh, so this, this will help to explain it. Uh, I wondered if it was a reference to being outside of the sun with the sun at a certain... It depends on what the reference illuminant is and, and then how close your source can get to that reference illuminant and the objects. Does anyone else have an answer for this gentleman's question or any thoughts on it? Because I think that's a very good question. Any other... Mark? Where where'd you... Mr. F Tom, what's your name? Full spectrum, right. Correct. So this woman was suggesting that the sun is a natural reference source to test against. But then realistically, when you're doing retail lighting or museum lighting, you're never going to see the sun as a reference source. So, and I think if you apply this to um, two different sources, so the incumbent today in museums, retail, and in so many other applications has been incandescent halogen. So use that as the reference and then test your LED against that. 
because this is specific to LEDs. So this, the other reference is Pantone colors that we want to match in retail, but then again, you know, that will change depending on the light. It also depend, it depends on what surfaces you're putting. Exactly. On. So this gentleman, this is again for that Waterloo audience, um, it suggested that the sun is a reference, uh, but also Pantone as a, as, a, as a reference, and then what are you lighting and what are the textures and the surfaces. To my point earlier on how the surface, the object, can modify that incident, way, that incident light in ways you never saw coming. So um, CRI, um, it's a metric that measures the change in chromaticity and color of the selected color patches initially from R8 down to R1. So these were the only colors that were first tested against and to develop CRI. And that was fine when we lived in a fluorescent metal halide incandescent world. Today we're living here in Disney color, right? Because we have a bazillion colors as a result of LEDs. So now we need to look at the saturated colors and skin tones at R15. So we talk today now about R9. How much red is in that LED source? Flip back to that SPD curve which had, which had a high blue peak wavelength. You have, you have no red in there. Somehow the manufacturer needs to get to red and there's different ways to get to red. And it involves energy and efficiency and a premium, depending on what kind of LED you're considering using. So these are the saturated colors, and we now look to those as a measurement of um, CRI as well. And the limitations here with CRI, just like I showed you, and I'll show you again. Now I'm using the ceiling. These are both 83 CRI. It's not enough anymore. I sure can, wherever and whoever you are. Um, <laughs> no, you come right up here. And I would like uh, this gentleman in the white, I'd like you to come up here too. And uh, I want a fair, fair skinned person. Do we have any Irish in the room? Someone like Romney or Julia. Romney. Okay. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's try to film you guys, so maybe you can move over here. And I don't know if this is going to work for the, those viewers at home or even up close, but let's see. Um, okay. So you guys get together. Get together like you're a group photo. Group hug, okay, okay, not so bad, right? Okay, sorry. You like that? That's not bad though, right? Isn't that the zero? But this is better. It's way better? So, the two, but the, what we're seeing here, 83 CRI at 3,000 Kelvin. This is 2,700 off the black body at 98 CRI. So off the black body is actually, because I would argue that if, if people, it doesn't matter if it's a tire store, if you're going in and the light is blue and you feel uncomfortable, it's not going to be a pleasant experience. But that's a 5 DUV and that's... Right. But now, um, let's see, I'm going to... Yeah, no, well, stay there once more. All right, so just to give you grounding again, this is an 83 CRI. This is a, a vanilla product. Everybody sells these all day long. It's, it's, it's standard, 83 CRI, 85 CRI. Um, whoops. <laughs> now, I've changed to a 2700 CCT and a 98 CRI. This was a source designed specifically for skin tones for a leading global cosmetics retailer. Um, I, and I'll, now I'll show you the, the other again. Um, the first one that was higher in the blue, because you've got a nice blue shirt on. And see, is that what you wanted to see also? So here's the blue. 
Here's a source that's um, off the black body. Here's one that's on. These are both the 83 CRI. This has a dimmer on, I want to make sure. Yeah. That one's more natural. Look at the jeans. His jeans. <laughs> New jeans, old jeans was my point, okay? <laughs> Hand to our demonstrators, thank you very much. So much. You're welcome. Friend. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yes? Sorry, I've never waited for you to see my hand. I just have to say. So I, I have a question about the, the R9 that's being... Question about R9? Okay, that's being enhanced into most of these into fixtures. Because it's a phosphor that's added. So, yes. We have a, I don't know, 10 or under or something like that. And, and, and they're being enhanced to a point of, you know, people come in, oh, look, we have an R9 of 89 and all of this stuff. So we designed a, a national department store chain and we did massive tests. We built rooms and, and did them and played with the high CRIs, the low CRIs and stuff. And in fact, not low, sorry, 83, <coughs> stuff like that. And in fact, the retailer, and they're not a low end retailer, chose the, the, the 83, 83 CRI. CRI. And in fact, typically when we're doing any spaces, we stay away from the 90 CRIs because the red has been pumped to such a point that we're actually getting pink. I actually think those three people look like they all had rashes. Um, and I'm wondering why, why are, are we pumping the R9 to 90? Like from 10 to 90, there had to be a point somewhere in the middle that did not create a pink circle and make people look pink. Now I get pink looks better than yellow on a human being. I get that, but there just seems to be such a, a vast amount. And when, like, like I said, this retailer said, I, I don't want that. The whole room looks pink. So for the viewers at home, uh, we're talking about. Is there a median R9 value that's appropriate? And she had a retail client. Retail client shows a lower R9, and that's fine. It, it's subjective. It's objective. Um, and regarding um, why is there a pink tone? Um, because you're pumping reds. You're pushing red. So there's going to be some residual. Oh, and I it's understand why it is. I just don't know why, the, I guess, the manufacturers have chosen to go from like 10, from 10 to, to 90, 90 instead of 50. Yeah, like why didn't they stop in the middle? Wouldn't we actually Because be part of that, and I'm, I'm going to guesstimate an answer here, and if I have colleagues in the room from Cree or Citizen who want to chime in, um, uh, uh, reds cost money. And so the higher R9 value, the more cost involved in producing that ship. Reds have uh, different thermal qualities than other colors, other phosphor materials. Reds are the first to fall off the thermal cliff, yeah. which means they're going to crash and burn. Uh, which is something to be careful when you're using a warm dimming source because many warm dim dimming sources have two sets of phosphor chips going. And if something happens to one set. So are they using it at a 90 because it's going to fall back? I couldn't guess. Because like it, it would be cheaper to produce a 50. Right, which is what Title 24 calls for in California okay. Okay, as a minimum standard. Okay. So, okay, not, so now you know why CRI has limitations because just because it's 83 doesn't mean it's going to look alike. Um, and for the above, CRI and how to determine or how to talk about why those blues look different, gamut area index is a more appropriate metric. So, gamut area index looks at um, a test source and a reference illuminant and maps it out in a color space. And it maps out those 15 color palettes that I showed you. They were here before in this bar graph here from R1 to R15. 15 color points mapped out in a color space, the 76 color space. And um, I forget, uh, blue is the deviant. It's the t um, test source. Red is the reference source or vice versa, it really doesn't matter. The point here being, although these could both have the same CRIs because they're measured or manufactured on and off the black body, they're going to be a stronger blue peak, lavenders, the vibrant color I showed you before, versus the standard 83 CRI. So this polygon helps you visualize color. This is a gamut area index. 
And this is one of the components of the new TM30. Um, and for the gamut area index, you don't want a high CRI and a high gamut because that would be weird. You want a good average CRI, 83, 85, and then a, a, a gamut area of like 1, 1, 5, 110 to get to a natural color point. If you go beyond in either direction, it's totally going to be trippy like LSD, so I'm told. Um, <laughs> Now this looks at gamut area and CRI, as I was just saying. The position and shape of the gamut area, these 15 color points, denotes where saturation occurs. And use it with CRI. Low CRI and high GAI will give you a weirdly saturated and unnatural appearance. Corpse-like is what I like to say. Um, and then lamp measurement. So this looks at our favorite lamps that we no longer use, an AR-111. So we all know an AR-111, great reds and oranges here, and a little bit of blue. Great retail lamp, great museum lamp. Um, the, R, the CRI is 99, R9 is 100, uh, and the gamut area is 99.1. When I take that, and now I lay it out, on the new TM30 metric, which looks at, um, no, sorry, I got ahead of myself. These are the 15 color points we measured, and it reflects using those color palettes where saturation occurs and where there's color. So it's just a little bit um, under in yellows and blues. But an LED and the AR111 lamp, there's very little difference in this gamut area index. Point of this story is this LED looks very much like a halogen source. Blue is the test source. Red is the black body radiator. This looks at the compact fluorescent. No surprises here. Color rendering of 77, zero red, minus three, uh, and a gamut area of 87. But when you look at it with the gamut area index, blue being the test source, red is the black body, you can see that saturation moving to the yellow weirdly pukey color here, and then um, stretching out here into the blues. This is, uh, sorry, this is a black body, very blue. This is an LED. Metal halide, a 20 watt color corrected metal halide. Same thing, we're looking at the gamut area index. It's the 15 color points mapped out in the 76 color space, so you can see what the color values are. And in this metal halide, using the 15 color points, there's no R9. The red. But we're not surprised, it's metal halide. Yet, yes, the SPD curve does show that there's some red in it, but not a high or saturated or nice mountainous of red. Um, this is one LED with a higher CRI laid out against a halogen source, high reds. Um, color corrected, 98 CRI, 3000 Kelvin, same thing. This is a standard, but you can see now there's some color shift on the polygon. Not color shift, but color deviation and looking at um, the gamut area index. And I know this is hard to see from back there, but the point is mapping the color space using gamut area. This is vibrant. This is the one that has... Um, the test source, this is where the blues looked really rich and strong, but this is uh, the black body locus. So this has an, an 84 CRI and 110 in the gamut area. Um, et cetera, you know this. So um, color science applied, getting color right with LEDs. Okay, this is where you want to uh, Take a few more notes or pay, uh, listen carefully. Because the application and the science of the source, these are the things you want to know. What temperature was a module performance quoted at? So this means on that spec sheet, is the data, was it measured at 70 degrees C, which is kind of the interior world we live in? Or was it tested at 55 degrees? Or was it tested at 85? because the source will begin to change over thermal stress. If it's tested at 55 degrees, 
the results you see in color mapping are going to be at 55, but you're not living in 55 degrees. So check at what temperature the source was tested at. Check the initial and maintained color tolerances on the color point. Is it sliding here or is it here on a bullseye right on that black body? And then look at the color rendering properties across the, those 15 color points that I pointed to. The saturated starting with R9 up to R15, which are skin tones. This is going to help you gauge where you are with getting a good color. And here now looking at temperature of the module performance specified. What this simply shows is that color shifts um, unless it's controlled properly, managed properly, which it can be done uh, with heat sinks, with thermals, with remote phosphor. So this shows you that um, macadam ellipse, the, the ideal starting point is, the, tar is the, the center of the bullseye. LEDs can be manufactured anywhere within these seven steps. And again, here it depends on what are you lighting, what's your budget. Because sometimes something with a four or seven step for potentially an outdoor car showroom might be OK, although I would argue not, because outdoor car showrooms are in the business of selling cars, and you need to see color. Um, point being, if you start here, where the purple is, and you, you can shift. The LED can shift in its color appearance and its lit effect. Um, because the color controllers aren't being managed properly. So you can move through that color space over the lifetime of the LED. Color shifts. Shift happens. <laughs> and it's important also to note that not all products behave in the same way. And I think you know that from specifying at one time, if you were doing the airport and you're doing T8s, it was going to be all Philips or Osram or GE. Because you knew from experience that Philips, Osram, and GE manufactured their fluorescence on a different color point. And that's why you might see a pinkish tone here and a green tone there. And it was completely legal by standards, and it was our secret recipes. We chose to manufacture a 3,000 Kelvin at 2750 or, or, 20, or, or 3850. It's just the way um, a manufacturer may choose to do business for a variety of reasons. So check the color point. Is it on the black body? Is it north or south? What's the temperature where the module or the, or the bar uh, was tested? And so this is just showing how color moves and shifts. These are both uh, 3,000 Kelvin tested at 1,000 milliamps, because depending on how hard you drive that LED, color can shift. And again, I, I want to also emphasize that not all color shifts. It depends on how it's made, how it's managed thermally, what kind of optics are in it. There's optical losses. Then the optic itself can change the color of the LED, whether it's a linear or a puck. Um, and then there's a color consistency guide. And um, this is from Rensselaer, and they recommend a two-step two macadam ellipse when these fixtures are used to illuminate an achromatic white scene, museums, some retail, uh, corporate lobby interiors, where it's all about creating a branding experience for the guests. Four steps, that's fine, and that's moving four steps away from the target point or off the black body, potentially. When fixtures are used to illuminate a visually complex multicolored scene, lighting a display case and accent lighting multicolored objects or paintings are some examples. Disagree, I totally disagree. Um, but that's a recommendation for them. But for two step spaces, the color consistency, consistency maintained should be one to two step initially. So at the beginning of its happy lifetime of 50,000 hours, color should be within a one by two step. Um, and over time, less than three steps of shift. So that means that you manufacture like where AC is, and it's never going to go beyond B. Um, color consistency, getting it wrong. We've lived this. We may have specified this. We may have sold this because this was then. Now we know more. There's no reason to live with this anymore. Um, and color consistency to get it white. And uh, get it right with white. 
Um, these are the 15 color points you want to check across the LED source. Color rendering guidance recommendations. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, and I think these, these may have come out of IES. But again, I think we're moving on. We're re beginning to recognize that there's no reason to have less than 70 color rendering in motorways and garages. You know, you need to determine, is it blood or oil on the pavement? Is, my, is that my car or is it my, someone else's car when you're walking through the car park? A color rendering example, this is just interior shots of halogen and um, a higher CRI uh, phosphor product. This was a tough one for the uh, designer to choose, but I thought it showed a great example of uh, halogen and LEDs mimicking each other. Check the gamut area black body. So this shows you um, where in that color space your source is against the black body radiator and the spectral power distribution. And this is a very interesting note here, but really subtle. In the vibrant, the thing that showed blues really well, um, there was a change in the cyan band. See how that cyan up there is a little bit higher than the one down here. This is all the science that goes into making um, the, phos the, uh, the, uh, the experience of light, the lit effect. It's these colors and playing with these colors. We purchase over 14 different phosphors to produce just four colors. It's an amazing science. It's in a very exacting science. Um, this is looking at um, the vibrant versus standard. You've all lived that and seen that now with Greg. Um, this is guidance on CRI and the black body. So point one, greater than 110 gamut area and look at the shape and position in the color space. Where is it going to peak? In the red oranges and the blues? Or is it following the black body, which might be what you want? Um, at least an 80 CRI. Um, depending on what you're lighting, uh, without excessive enhancement, you might, you might want to pop blues and purples and reds and whites. Um, and the balance. A higher CCT is going to have a higher gamut area index. So that's going to be a little more saturated and really vivid color. So maybe you're doing a new Disney store. Maybe you're doing a children's hospital playroom and it really needs to come to life. Um, and this is the uh, checklist for specifying LED luminaires. Um, get the LM80 report. If there's no LM80, it's not really an LED that you want to use. Um, and this next point goes to looking at the temperature of the test reports. A, a low case temperature is at 55 degrees. That's just the module, but the luminaire might be living in an 85 degree ceiling. So color is going to shift, or the, the LED may have a, um, a short, unhappy life because the thermals are going to increase. Um, look at color consistency at the beginning of life of the, of the source and over time. Look at color rendering on all 15 test colors, including those saturated ones, R9 to R15. Um, and ideally, you want to uh, get a working production sample of the module or the uh, board and a luminaire that corresponds with the, with the data. And these things will ensure qualitative and quantitative results. Happy campers, good experience, good light. OK? So um, there you have LEDs and getting color right. This is about, <laughs> I think this is just a great summary. Depends on, OK, this guy bought LEDs first out of the bin, and, and that was 10 years ago. And he's like totally not seeing it. This guy, he got something like eight years ago. This dog has the newest production today, right? Because dogs can't see color. They see gray, yellow, blue, I think. So um, I think I've answered in any. Are there any other questions I can answer for you regarding this? Could you uh, kindly comment on the evolution of testing equipment for these values in particular? 
Uh, the question is, could I comment on equipment that's available for testing today and the evolution of equipment? My, f my gut answer would be no, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I've seen amazing handheld apps. Um, $1,500, you, you pass it over the light source, it spits out on a little piece of paper what the values are, it shows you the SPD cor curve. I haven't seen a, I haven't seen that yet. Does that, can anyone answer the his question? Does anyone have good equipment handheld that they're using today? Yeah, there's a variety of spectrometers, colorimetry, handheld devices. Um, my colleagues or IES could probably answer that for you. I haven't seen that. That's a good question. Okay. Um, I'm going to check on time. It's, I have 1.15. Shall I go talk about TM30 for a minute? Yes, please. Okay. <coughs> now, um, this... I. I have to tell you, um, this is a Zakata report, my disclosure, okay? Um, but that's because we jumped on T30 immediately when it was first available. So we started publishing TM30 like 48 hours after the IES released it. But we'd been using gamut area as a metric to explain Vibrant and Artist and the beauty series. So TM30 um, is, a, is a much better metric, I'm not going to go through this because you know this, that light determines how we see and what we see. Naturally without light there's no visual perception, although you know that the banana is yellow. Um, so this is Zuccato Man, he's a character we've used to help people understand color and I can't show you the video. Okay, um, so the, uh, the, this is the institute, the CIE, color rendering versus TM30. So the CRI, the first standard was used to assign a color value and a color quality, um, is a 1964 and it used um, UV primes. It only used, used those eight pastels for CRI. It only looked at the fidelity, how true the source was to those eight pastels. And you had to have the reference illuminant for the step function. And there was no lower limit. I mean, yeah, there was, but you still understood that, hey, if it's 83, it's got to be pretty good, right? I showed you differently. Today, TM30 uh, uses 99 color samples. So they've gone beyond the R15 val for the, the 15 color values. They're measuring nine for uniform color space coverage, um, neutral spectral sensitivity, they've taken away all the interruptions and the incident factors, and they use a variety of real objects, whereas um, CRI was very limited in its science. But they did, that was the best available at that time. Um, and then they use, um, a continuant reference illuminance. So they use reference sources but blended between 45 and 5,000 Kelvin. And then there's a fidelity scale. So there's more variables in TM30, but it gives you a better, much better understanding visually of the color result, the result of the, the source. <clears throat> and these are the values or the metrics that go into just CRI itself. So it is the color fidelity or the naturalness. And then it's both discrimination and preference going into color rendering. And this is input from um, test participants <coughs> at when CRI was developed as a metric. And discrimination and preference are related with saturation. And that's saturation is quantified on that gamut area that mapped out the 15 color points. And you could see then where blue was peaking, where red and rosy were peaking. Today, the IES looks at these metrics now for TM30. Color fidelity is the accurate rendition of color. 
so that they appear as they would under the familiar reference illuminance. So it's a fidelity index. That's one. Then the gamut looks at that gamut area, it plots it out. This is, I think, the best and one of the most interesting aspects of TM30. So this is my uh, reference illuminant, the black body here, the black circle. This is the test source. And as it moves in, it's going to get uh, lower saturation, lower intensity, softer. If it pushes out, you'll see, you would see that it's going to be richer in this region, or this region, or this region. Every manufacturer can and should publish this data for every source. It's richer, it's truer, it shows more value. And you can see now where color is going to appear. And I think, again, if you're selling a design to a client and they can't visualize why it's worth it to pay more for better color rendering, higher quality LED, look at this graphic. That's a color distortion graphic. So we've got the fidelity on a scale of 0 to 100. We've got the gamut. And their recommendation is anywhere from 60 to 140 when fidelity is greater than 60. And I think these are just really wild and fun graphics, but it shows this is where there's 99 color points. That's what TM30 is built on. And this is their various um, the wavelength mapped out of those 99 color points. Far more visually complex and arresting than the 15 color points or a simple CRI value. And we're not going to look at the calculation engine. Um, the limitations of the TM30, um, it doesn't lend itself necessarily well to sources that are built off the black body because, uh, as I showed you, 83 CRI and 83 CRI that renders blues differently, those are both white sources, but one's off the black body. And, and to your point about pink being reflected at that retail store, that source, I'm pretty sure, was off the black body. And that's OK. That's the way it was designed. But you're going to see some distortion in color. Um, it's, um, and it's only about colors, as I'm saying. The white point accuracy is a little funny, funky when you're using whites and lightly colored objects. So what are you lighting? That's why you want to look at 99 different color points. A carpet showroom. Um, where you've got a lot of rich colors. Um, TM30 is going to be a great metric. Um, if you're only using this, TM30 works, but also look at white point accuracy on the black body to help you visualize and see what the end result is. That's thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, download all the stuff from the IES on TM30. Um, Zaccato publishes TM30 for all of our color points. Um, we also have uh, an academic objective overview of what is TM30. Um, but I think it's going to be more broadly accepted. It's only been launched last fall. IES is getting out across the world with Kevin Hauser, Michael Royer from PNNL, uh, the Department of Energy, and uh, Randy Burkett, lighting designer, to help people understand, and they're educating people on it. So if you have the chance to go to any seminar on TM30, go. Uh, because I think CRI leaves us all in the dust, and it's very confusing. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for having me. This was fun, great models. Thank you all very much. Um, And I think I want to leave it now to someone to close the session and say thanks for coming. Sean? Um, I believe there's some Q&A on the tablet from Waterloo. And if there, of course, if there's any other questions before we finish in the audience. I was actually wondering what would happen if we mix the CRI 83 and then the other blower tar that's off uh, black body. If we kind of mix them together, would that create a broader spectrum that can compensate I couldn't find the question. Um, your question was mixing an 83 CRI with a source that's off the black body? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that's, what, what would happen if they mix? That's what, oh, let's see. Yeah, I, I, 
So I can, all I can do is show this on the floor. Is that what you're saying? And I'm sure the camera can't pick this up, but. On the ceiling, perhaps? Interesting, right? Okay, there's a question out there. Um, how is DUV plus minus system different from binning? or macadam ellipses measure? Then it says for me to say something. Um, DUV looks at above and below the black body. It's a complementary metric to macadam ellipse. Macadam ellipse is just a different mapping of a metric. Macadam ellipse uh, looked at the color space in general, the whole space, to understand where differences were viewed by participants. But DUV, I think, is a, is a better metric today because uh, the black body through the space, you can see that on the color map, and then you can see on that vector line if it's going to be green or yellow, whereas a macadam ellipse is a, is a, is a, a blob. Yeah, it, it's, a more, it's more difficult to distinguish. That's my opinion. And I always welcome input or corrections from the audience because I'm not a scientist, I'm not an electrical engineer. Anyone want to comment on how DUV is different than um, macadam ellipse or binning? Binning is related to uh, the black body and the vector line. If someone's binning today, I don't think that they're using the best technology available to them. Never anymore rely on binning to set your color quality. It's not sufficient because binning can take that whole space and say, yeah, it's 3,000 Kelvin. That one's in warm and that one's in cool. But they're both 3,000 Kelvin. OK. Sir? Um, the TN30 uh, metric. metric, is there a, uh, like there's a CRI rating that we all understand, 80 is above is good, below is poor. Is there that standard that exists for TN30? The question is, there, is there a single end number, perhaps, for TM30, like there is with CRI? No. You have to look at all four metrics, because it depends on what you're lighting. Um, and looking at both CRI and fidelity and gamut and then the graphic. But there is no one single number definitive TM30. You can look at um, all four values. And you don't want to be high in GRI and high on CRI because you're going to have a very strange distortion. So that's when one metric can be proven to be insufficient, CRI. Because what if it has um, a high gamut error? That's going to be that very weirdly rich, vivid color experience. So you have to look at all four. So the process remains uh, theoretical and analytical and has it been vetted by the human observer? Yes, most definitely. And it's not? TM30 was uh, a two-year undertaking with both uh, academics and technicians uh, as well as test participants. I can't quantify how many test participants there were, but it is the standard uh, propagated by the IES, promoted by the IES, um, and it isn't yet to be widely adopted, but it's something in use today. There's no reason why you can't be using TM30 today. It's just getting out there on the street now. Um, I think uh, CIE, I believe, is still, uh, I'm sorry, I have to retract that. I'm not sure where they are on the, on the issue. So I'm not a TM30 expert, but I'm a believer in it because of the, the end results, what we've seen. OK. All right. Thanks, John. This was a great question. We're getting older. What is the reference person? And that's a good question. So that's why the, the McAdam test, actually, men, white, in their 40s, working at Kodak. That does not represent this room. Whereas TM30 and other tests today represent a much broader swath of the you know, cross patch of, the, of um, the human condition. Many people, different visual systems, make better test results.
Thank you. Thank you, Waterloo.